Chapter 4 The life of the faithful should be filled with joy and gladness, which are among the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit himself gives these fruits both to our souls and to our community. Galatians 5, 22-23 At the same time, our life must be something that transcends the world, informed by theological thought and feeling, manifesting the experience of eternity in the place and time in which we live. We are obliged truly to be people of eternity. If we are not thinking theologically, and if our relationships are not relationships of essential contact with God, then our life will not only be prosaic and vain, but also an object of ridicule for demons, sinners, and all those who hate us. At the same time, it will be a tremendous disappointment for us in the eyes of God, since we will never be able to rise beyond the height of our own heads, even though our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians 3.20 We are reading St. Maximus the Confessor, just as we read all the other fathers of the church in Holy Scripture, and we are explaining and commenting on his words, not so we can learn what he says in the second century of his chapters on love, but so that you yourselves can learn how to read and understand the writings of the fathers. A monastery that does not offer this kind of teaching, and indeed often, is not a monastery. Such souls, uninstructed in the fathers, are preyed upon by the devil and slowly become uncultivated, being unable to make any progress, and being castrated in this way, are unable to bring anything spiritual to birth. A monastery without such instruction is the gateway and entrance of the evil one. To be sure, God intervenes and can raise up his own people even from stones, transforming sinners into saints, the sons of harlots into priests, and the husbands of harlots into prophets, as we see in Scripture. But this is the work of grace. Is it possible for us always to have these gatherings and offer such teaching? No, it is not. And this is why we read and comment on the fathers. Human weakness and other human factors sometimes prevent us from being together. Thus, when we do gather together, we read and explain the writings of the fathers so that you can learn how to read them and be able to understand and explain them, and not simply to explain what they mean, but to assimilate your lives to those meanings so that you will acquire for yourself the spirit of the fathers. Some of you sometimes complain to me that we don't have enough teaching. This is a complaint that brings me joy since it reveals the thirst of your soul. Even so, if you yourselves don't learn how to read and understand the fathers, you will accomplish nothing. What I am offering you in these talks is simply an introduction, which must be followed by your own study and reflection. An introduction is something that is given only once. After that come the various chapters of the book. This means that it is possible to study the fathers at great length and over a long period of time, and through our personal study of their writings to draw forth the whole of their mind and meaning, their inspired views, teachings, and doctrines, which are conveyed to us through them by the Holy Spirit. We are obliged to learn, to think, and to live, to rejoice, and to weep, to experience God and be raised to the heavens, exactly as did the saints of the church. This follows from the unity of the church, which is something that God grants to us when we gather together. This same unity means that it is preferable to read the writings of the fathers in their entirety, as well as scripture in its entirety, and not anthologies of selected passages that we think or someone else thinks have special value or interest. Life itself is an integral whole. It does not consist in conclusions derived from passages taken from a father which are deemed to be the most important. The practice of many people to read extracts taken from the writings of the fathers of the church or extracts from Holy Scripture is not appropriate to an Orthodox reader because such a practice fragments the unity of life. Life is one. Life is a whole. It is not this part and then that part, or this topic and then that topic, which happens to interest us at this particular moment. Instead, we must be fully informed about everything that the fathers were engaged with so that we can have a universal awareness of our life, the life of the church and the life of God. But let us return to St. Maximus. 
We said earlier that I must transcend my difficulties, my pain, and whatever is lacking or deficient. Now I have gotten past my pain. It doesn't bother me anymore. I no longer worry about what I don't have, and neither am I concerned about my particular way of thinking about things, or my desires, or my feelings. I love everyone in the same way. Now I am truly alone, all one, with the one God. Now it is just me and God. I am no longer interested in this or that person or in any particular thing. Above all, I am no longer concerned about myself. The only thing that exists for me is God, before whom I have become like a beast of burden, Psalms 72, 22, which means I have placed everything before God, subjected all things in my life to the Father, subjecting my will to his, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. It is now that my mind can progress to the love of God. Up until this point, I was but a little child playing in the church under the protection of God's grace. Though you can see how immature I was and how incapable I was of living a spiritual life. This is why St. Maximus says the following. When the mind begins to make progress in the love of God, the demon of blasphemy begins to tempt it and suggest to it such thoughts as no man but only the devil their father could invent. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.14. In this chapter, the Confessor's words are quite striking. Quote, when the mind begins to make progress in the love of God. He does not say when the heart begins to make progress in the love of God. The heart is not at issue here. The heart simply needs something to lean on, something to rest on in order to start beating loudly. When the heart sees that Christ's love gives it rest or takes away its burden or eases its conscience or promises that it will take care of its problems, it loves Christ immediately and without any hesitation or difficulty. And when the heart beholds how desirable and beautiful Christ is, how could it not love him? And when it sees him crucified, and calling it to join him on the cross, the heart will rejoice in suffering, even if it fears suffering, because it is easy to suffer together with Christ. But the heart can easily be deceived and confuse its feelings of divine love with false forms of love. Love is not the feeling or emotion I have when I sin or when I hurt or when I have a feeling of sweetness in my heart. This is why St. Maximus says, when the mind, not the heart, begins to make progress in the love of God. Love is that element that unites us with God. Love distances me from myself and binds me closely to God. And my deeper being that tends towards God and which can draw together with it the whole of the human person is my spirit. The human spirit is similar to God in the sense that it can draw near to God and be united with him. If then my spirit loves God and then my mind will also be absorbed by God. And then I can say that I love God and my mind will bring with it my body and my soul. If, however, we hold very low and cheap views of love and think that one little tear or one strong emotion or one decision that we make, I will become a monk or I became a monk is the love of God. You can see how easy it is for us to live a life of complete deception and falsehood which in no way differs from the deceptions and falsehoods in which the whole world lives. We would be deservedly counted with the rubbish and rabble of the world. Many times we need an entire lifetime to understand what the love of God is. When, however, we do come to understand it and begin to make progress in it, we may at that point experience blasphemous thoughts. This is why St. Maximus now moves beyond the things we saw in the previous chapters and tells us that there is another kind or category of person, another level on which demonic thoughts occur. The great majority of people leave the vineyard of their soul wide open. Just about all of us are found in this category. We allow an unruly mob of thoughts to enter and crowd our minds, making our heads a kind of bombardment site. And we allow our mind to be filled continually with strange things because we do not have the Spirit of God and because we have never really been interested in God anyway. When someone's head is filled with thoughts, it means he is not filled with God. 
if he had God, then where is the power and the love of God to remove all the thoughts that torment his mind on a daily and indeed hourly basis? To be filled with thoughts reveals a lack of repentance, which means there has been no change of mind. It signals an absence of spiritual life, an absence of basic elemental experience of God, and thus the absence of God. Yet there is also a particular kind of person who has thoughts or who experiences temptations of the flesh, as was the case with certain saints. They are those people whose minds have begun to progress in the love of God. Into their minds, Satan places such thoughts that no human being could concoct, including the person having the thoughts. Just think how evil and blasphemous such thoughts are in the eyes of God. What kinds of thoughts are these? Blasphemous thoughts are thoughts that deny the divinity of Christ or the mystery of the Holy Trinity. They also ascribe the divine activities of God to Satan. For example, I am speaking to you in the spirit. I am speaking the truth. And you say, come on now, don't be so stupid. In general, blasphemous thoughts are those which turn against God, against divine revelation, against the works and activities of God, especially when these are said to come from the devil. As the Pharisees said about Christ, quote, it is through the devil that he casts out demons. Matthew twelve twenty four. He does this out of envy for the friend of God, so that coming to despair at having such thoughts, he no longer dares to approach God in his usual prayers. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.14. To continue, as St. Maximus says, the devil is envious of the person who is God's friend, and through blasphemous thoughts wants to drive him to despair. Seeing such thoughts pass through his mind, the friend of God becomes downcast and dispirited, thinking that he has utterly failed, that he can do nothing, that he is beyond correction, that he is a sinner, and thus he cannot bring himself to say his usual prayers, which is the noetic prayer of the mind. And we have already said that it is this prayer which is itself union with God and the casting out of all thoughts. When the friend of God abandons his prayer, he creates even more room for the devil's activities, and he will take away his courage to spread his spiritual wings and fly to God. Thus there are people who have begun to love God and who progress in that love, but who have thoughts. But the thoughts they have are extremely dark, terrifying, repugnant, and mostly blasphemous. At the same time, these thoughts darken the person's mind and make him lose all sense of where he is. They make him feel that his own soul is nothing but a terrible burden, as if an impenetrable haze has enveloped him, the likes of which he could never have imagined. But none of these things are a danger to him, since they are signs that he is making progress in his spiritual life. Again, when we begin to love God, we are assailed by blasphemous thoughts that come from the evil one. If we have not attained to this level, then we should not say that Satan is putting evil thoughts in our minds. If we have not made any real progress on our spiritual path, then the devil remains outside the monastery fast asleep or outside your home, outside your heart. He's not even thinking about you. The negative and other thoughts you are experiencing are generated by you. Why? Because you love them and are attached to them. Because within you are various passions that you nourish and keep alive, lest their fire cools down and they are extinguished and you lose them. Any kind of thought we are attached to testifies to the presence of a corresponding passion, and indeed a passion that we love. If we didn't love it, it wouldn't be on our mind all the time, and would have less left us long ago. But we love it, we cling to it, we nourish it, and in truth, we don't want it to go, even if sometimes we pray and ask God to take it away from us. Such a prayer is a mockery of ourself and God. Nevertheless, the accursed one derives no profit from his plan, but rather makes us more steadfast. For engaging in offensive and defensive battle, we become more proven and genuine in the love of God. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.14 Now we are able to discern the true love of God. Those who do not love God because they do not have a solid spiritual life and are without grace 
are tormented and overwhelmed by their own thoughts, which trouble and hound them incessantly. These thoughts prevent them from making any progress, but the thoughts that come from Satan are of no benefit to Satan. The accursed one derives no profit from his plan. Who is the accursed one? The one who never forgets and who is never forgotten. The one who stays on your trail like a hunter and who makes it difficult for you to shake him from your mind. The accursed one is temptation. It is Satan. Because who forgets Satan? By means of the temptations he is always placing before us, we are continually reminded of him, and neither does he forget about us. Until the moment when he is able to cast us into the mouth of hell, he will not forget about us, and he only allows himself to sleep when he knows that we are exactly where he wants us. It's like a mother who swaddles her baby and puts it in its cradle to sleep, after which she knows she can attend to other things, and that when she returns, the baby will still be swaddled and sleeping. This is how Satan works. He tries and tempts everyone. He has swaddled all of us very tightly, and we are completely in his hands, even when we pray, even when we fast. Praying and fasting are divine things only when our relations with God and our neighbors are healthy. The accursed one designates one who cannot be forgotten because of his evil. He is so evil that you remember him always, just as when you've seen or experienced something so absolutely horrifying that you're never going to forget it. So too will the accursed one who is so horrifying in his evil, so malicious, so vile, so repulsive that you can't get it out of your mind. Yet neither the thought of him nor his evil can harm us in any way. To the contrary, these things only make us more steadfast. When our thoughts are from the evil one as permitted by God and we ourselves are not the cause of them, these are thoughts that indicate spiritual progress. The devil's plans are foiled and we emerge more proven and genuine in our love for God. And as strange as it may sound, the devil himself, even though this is not his wish, succeeds only in making us stronger. Let us add this. A man who is untried, untested, lacking in experience is like a little boat that has never been in the water. You don't even know if it can float, let alone survive in choppy seas and difficult weather. If we are untried and untested, we cannot and must not trust in our own abilities. We will be tried and tested by the people around us and by the difficulties that life puts in our way. If we are unable to rise above such difficulties, if we cannot endure the resistance, false accusations, and pain that others introduce into our life, if we do not experience affliction, then we are not even at the beginning of our spiritual journey. We must first experience these things before we can have any confidence in our abilities. One of the worst things about being young is lack of experience, which often causes young people to make mistakes and be led astray. The untried person can find himself standing before Satan and actually think it's Christ. Or other people will tell him something, anything, and he'll believe it because he lacks experience. His lack of experience can easily lead him into ignorance, errors, condemnations, all kinds of trouble. This is why young people who, as a rule, lack experience, require the counsel and advice of strong older people who have passed through life's trials and overcome them. Trials and temptations are necessary for the person. If someone is afraid of trials and temptations, he will not make progress in life. If when affliction comes upon you and you think it is something bad, if when your brother falsely accuses you of something and you think he is evil and you seek to correct him, when you struggle and fight against pain, when you seek to live a secure and comfortable life without any difficulties or troubles, then you can be sure that you will accomplish absolutely nothing. It is only on the difficult path, marked by toil and affliction, that you can make any progress. It is only this path that God recognizes. It is only the soul that has been tried and tempted that God sees. A soul that is untried is able to drink only a little bit of milk and only from the breast, not even from a bottle, which would be too difficult. If it were able to drink from a bottle, God would give it a bottle. And if the soul were able to drink from that, in time, God would cease to feed it with milk. Thus, only those who have been tried, by which I mean only those who have responded in the right way to their pain and suffering, only those whose, 
who truly love their struggle can make progress. It goes without saying that we are not deliberately going to subject ourselves to trials and temptations because this would be sinful. It would be a movement to the other extreme. But when a temptation does present itself to us, we need to know that it is potentially the best thing for the salvation of our soul. And when the people around us make our lives difficult, we need to understand that they are in reality our benefactors and our best friends. If you have a friend who never causes you any trouble or difficulties, don't think that he will be of any spiritual benefit to you. And he'll all he'll do is make you incapable of traveling on the road that leads beyond this world. It is clear then that the love of God is acquired only through trials and difficulties. But his sword will pierce his heart and his bows will be shattered. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.14, Psalm 37.15. In the end, we will win and Satan will lose. He will be shattered. He will be destroyed by the very same sword he turned against us. His own sword will strike him in the heart. Thus, all the many trials that we undergo, and certainly the trials experienced by the friends of God, by those who love God, bring about the utter defeat of the evil one and the victory of the faithful. The mind, in applying itself to visible things, knows them in accordance with nature through the medium of the senses. And neither is the mind evil, nor natural knowledge, nor visible things, nor the senses, for all these are the works of God. What then is evil? Clearly it is the passion associated with the natural representations of things in the mind, which does not have to exist in these representations if the mind is watchful. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.15 once again, St. Maximus is speaking about the mind because that is where the game of life is played out. When he says the mind is occupied with visible things, it is like seeing an angel getting mixed up with the flesh. What do I mean by this? The mind was created in order to turn to God. This is its most natural characteristic and function. When, however, the mind becomes preoccupied with visible things, with material things, it operates through the senses, usually because its spiritual senses have atrophied and it falls back on its natural carnal senses. When this happens, the mind experiences the world through sight, taste, smell, hearing, and touch. It's like someone whose heart was removed because it wasn't working and was replaced with a plastic one or a plastic stomach or a pair of artificial eyes. The mind has its own senses through which it sees and touches God. But when the king, as it were, becomes a beggar wandering through the streets, then it understands the world naturally through its senses and not through noetic perception. If you want to see the stars, you need an eye able to see the macrocosm, by which I mean a telescope. If you look at the stars with unaided eyes, which are designed to see objects that are immediately around us, you won't see anything you'll fail in your effort to see what's there. In the same way, you'll fail if you try to see and understand things with your mind, if that is, your mind is engrossed in material objects and phenomena. And where does evil exist? In the mind? The mind itself is not evil, neither is thinking a sin. You have the right to think in a manner according to nature. Neither are physical objects in the world evil, nor the physical senses that grasp them. So why then, St. Maximus, do you condemn me for understanding things through the eyes of the body? Here's an example of what I mean. I see a person gossiping. Then I see someone else join him, and then the two of them start gossiping. I conclude that the first person has negatively influenced the second person, and I decide that I must separate them since the one is harming the other, just as it says in Scripture, bad conversation ruins good character. 1 Corinthians 15.33 Based on what I see, immediately I draw a conclusion, arrive at a judgment, and make a decision. But my understanding and interpretation of what I have seen is based solely on the senses, solely on external observation. Does this then mean that the outcome I arrived at was false? It would seem to have been correct. 
But if you consider the matter with the Spirit of God, you'll discover that your eyes told you nothing. For the most part, we think that our thoughts and our way of thinking is absolutely perfect and that everything we think we know is perfectly accurate and that there is no need to question it. Of, of course, you may be right, but only on the level of outward sense perception, only in terms of natural criteria and physical standards of judgment. If you were to look at things with the criteria of God, they would look very different. All things can be seen and understood in two ways, according to the senses and according to the spirit, according to physical vision and according to spiritual insight and understanding. These two ways or modes can coincide in the same way that the natural law can coincide with the spiritual law, but they can also be separated and sharply divided. The truth of something may be separated by such a great distance that it is so deep, so hard to perceive that you could miss it completely. Thus, someone could look at something from a conventional moral perspective and based on social conventions or practices come to a particular conclusion. Someone else might look at the same thing from the perspective of his ascetic life and experience and be inspired or receive a revelation and come to exactly the opposite conclusion. You might then ask, what, are there two moralities, two dogmas? Are there two gospels, two gods? Of course not. There is only one, but each person sees things from a different perspective with a different pair of eyes. These are all works of God. Sense perception is not evil. Neither are the visible things of the natural world evil, nor is the mind or the, act, the activity of thinking. When it is in accordance with nature, evil. Neither are any of these things sinful because they are creations of God. What is evil is when I see you wearing glasses and say, it serves you right. When we were kids, didn't I tell you not to read with your eyes so close to the book? But what is not evil is for the mind to think and express itself in a manner consistent with nature. What then is evil? Clearly, it is the passion associated with the natural representations of things in the mind, which does not have to exist in the mind's use of these representations if the mind is watchful. When the spiritual senses, the noetic senses of the mind, come into contact with God, they receive divine grace and share in the divine energies, which grant us a spiritual apprehension of reality. Conversely, knowledge based on sense perception alone is something external, something bodily, and also psychological or perhaps emotional, which is why it often seems so powerful and moving and thus persuasive. Here an example will be helpful. A saint steps outside his cell and he sees a physically beautiful but sinful woman walking down the street. He sees her beauty and he says, look at the beauty with which God has created human beings. Just imagine how beautiful God himself must be. The saint is not looking at the woman carnally and neither is he seeing her simply through his bodily eyes. But I, on the other hand, look at you and see how beautiful you are. I feel your beauty overwhelming me suffocating me. It is something that confounds my being because in this case, my eyes fill me with the perception of the flesh and not with spiritual vision. My mind did not see by means of its noetic eyes, but rather with the eyes of the body. Again, the sense of vision is very powerful, very palpable. It is something that can completely enslave you, completely absorb and consume you. The resulting passion is something brought into being largely by the mind. This is why St. Maximus says that this is the passion associated with the natural representations of things in the mind. In, it is the inclination, the impulse, the attachment of the mind, not simply to material objects, but to the natural images and representations of these objects in the mind. Just as a small child crawls around on its hands and legs, so too does the mind become accustomed to looking at the world through strange eyes, that is, solely through the eyes of the body, through the eyes of the flesh, which will always lead it to bodily thoughts and fleshly images. What then am I able to think about? Well, right now, I'm thinking that I need a new abital staff. The one I have has gotten old. It's about to break in two. If I lean on it too hard, I'll fall down. Or when I see you and I realize I need to tell you something and I tell myself not to forget to speak with you, 
This means that my mind has an idea or concept, a representation, and so it turns to things and situations around me. Passions do not have to exist in the mind's use of these representations if the mind is watchful. If the mind were not preoccupied with visible things, but always remained watchful and thought only about God, then it would have no need to make use of any mental representations. In fact, it would have no such representations at all. But as we said earlier, it would be empty, seeking only the Lord God. Were that to happen, God would become visible to the mind through the mind's sense of spiritual understanding. The only evil here is that the mind becomes accustomed to thinking in a bodily, carnal way. It becomes used to thinking solely in terms of human logic. The mind is always filled with thoughts, images, and the mental representations of things in the world, with one thought following another in rapid succession, absorbing the mind in problems, ideas, opinions, and desires. But when a person has his mind continually turned toward God, then the mind is emptied and is able to be filled with God. This is how the saints live. The saint has God. He knows he belongs to the one church, which is the church of the saints. He knows also that he is a sinner, a child of Adam, but that he has been reborn through Christ, 1 Corinthians fifteen forty five, who is the new Adam. On the other hand, most of us are seriously mistaken when and to the extent that we think we are saints. And we usually do this because we are seeing only one side of things, the activity of God's grace in our life. We don't see the mud and the dirt with which we are covered, which we carry around with us wherever we go. The saints have the fullness of knowledge. They see, on the one hand, their own sinfulness, and on the other hand, they see the holiness, the grace, and the love of God in which they share. The saints are always, they are aware that they are saints in the sense that they share in the life and sanctity of God. They are holy because God is holy, and they live and experience the fullness of His holiness, the presence of the holy God. At the same time, they are fully aware that they are sinners, and it is in this awareness that their sanctity consists. They do not live in sin, but they know that sin is present in their members. This is why they purify themselves, making themselves fragrant vessels of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, who is the source of all holiness, sanctifies them and makes them holy. He makes them saints, having great boldness of speech and intercessory power before him. See Romans 6, 13 and 2 Timothy 2, 21. We, on the other hand, when we think that we have acquired even some small virtue, become proud and conceited because we have not acquired the corresponding knowledge of our sin and of who and what we are. In addition to this, we confuse the Holy Spirit with what we think we are, that I am a saint, that I have this or that virtue. You can see how egotism produces profound errors of judgment. It is a crisis of understanding. Whoever thinks he is some kind of saint is judging things solely from a human point of view, solely according to the flesh, and he draws the mistaken conclusion that he is holy. But the true saint never thinks like this. He never judges things according to outward appearances, but according to divine inspiration and illumination, and thus he never misses the mark of truth. This is why he has boldness of speech before God. He says, In the name of Jesus Christ, arise, and the dead rise from their graves. At the same time, he prays as a sinner because he knows the double nature of man, which is both earthly and spiritual. But he also knows that that into this same flesh was born Christ himself. To be sure, a saint can fall. And his first fall is always the turn toward himself, toward his love of himself, to his own life. His second fall, which is far worse, is his error of judgment, for this marks the consummation of his fall. The fall begins with the former and is completed through the latter. The moment the saint turns his attention to himself, he has fallen. When that happens, it is like an eagle has fallen from the sky and has been dashed to the ground. And if the second mistake occurs, the eagle will die in the place where it has fallen. But even if this should happen, he can still repent, although it will require many years, many tears, and much pain of heart. 
Concerning the person who wishes to be sanctified, who wishes to live a holy life, St. Maximus tells us, first, that Satan will present his mind with various temptations, and that these will make him more proven and sincere in his love for God. Second, that a weak person sees the world solely through his physical senses and is turned more or less wholly toward visible things, and that this is the worst possible state for the person to fall into because once the mind becomes habituated into this level of thinking and logic, it becomes incapable of understanding or even conceiving of the things of God. Sadly, we see this kind of situation everywhere, in monasteries, in the way the monks think, among the married clergy, in synods of bishops, and anywhere else you care to look, the same fallen logic prevails. And how much more so in our everyday life, but you may ask, is this kind of thinking a sin? In and of itself, it is not. But when it renders us incapable of receiving God, when it prevents us from entering paradise, and when it leads us in turn to hinder others from entering the kingdom of heaven, as the Lord said about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, then you can see how corrupt and destructive it is. See Matthew twenty three fourteen. Anyone can fall into this way of thinking but it mostly affects those who consider themselves intellectuals, who think that they know everything, but whose superficial intelligence or narrow expertise conceals a deeper and far-reaching ignorance. Some may appear to be spiritual, but just as Scripture says, their thinking is futile and their foolish hearts are darkened, and thus they fall and are lost all because of their vain and confused thoughts. See Romans one twenty one. Some of you will know the story about the elder who asked his disciple to perform a particular task, but the disciple did not want to do it and objected vehemently. You will perform this task, the elder said, because it was given to you by your elder. The disciple, however, would not listen, even though the elder showed him that his behavior was self-willed and in contradiction to his monastic vows, which are promises he made to God. A few days later, they were visited by St. Pacomius, and the elder said to him, Holy Father, my disciple is disobedient. What should I do with him? I gave him a task to perform, and he refuses to do it. And what did you do? The saint asked him. There's nothing I can do, the elder said. Then instead of that task, give him one that he wants, and maybe he'll change the way he thinks and make some progress, because it often happens that a bad person, when treated kindly, becomes a good person. At the same time, St. Pacomius spoke privately with the disciple and said, What kind of task would you like the elder to give you? Choose whichever one you want. At these words, the disciple was confounded, and he made a great prostration at the feet of the saint, striking his forehead on the ground. Think about what it would be like if everyone here insisted on following the dictates of his own will, to demand whatever it is he wants. Such a person has been consumed by his ego, by his self-will, and will never be happy in life. But how different is, is this way of thinking from spiritual discernment? In the next chapter, St. Maximus reveals the structure of a passion. Passion is a movement in the soul contrary to nature, either toward irrational love or senseless hate of something, or on account of something material. For example, it can be toward irrational love of food, or a woman, or wealth, or fleeting glory, or any other material thing, or on their account. Or it can be toward a senseless hate of any of the preceding things we spoke of, or on account of anyone. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.16. Elder Emilianos continues, it is possible to hate someone with a hatred that is senseless, which designates a feeling that has no basis in any kind of rational judgment. But to hate your father or your mother for the sake of Christ is neither irrational nor lacking in discernment. See Luke 14, 26. Senseless and irrational love can be directed toward people in different kinds of sensory objects, such as food or a woman. Someone, for example, may love food and loves to eat. This is the passion of gluttony. Someone else may have an irrational love for a particular woman, while someone else loves a woman without his love being irrational or impassioned. Or wealth or fleeting glory. 
Another person loves money or glory. Of course, everyone loves glory, which is why God, in order to protect us from this passion, has given us so many promises concerning the kingdom of heaven he has prepared for us, or any other material thing. Someone can also have an irrational love for an object of one kind or another. All these loves are nothing but symptoms of the passions, and thus they are all false, futile, corrupt, and fleeting. Or it can be toward a senseless hate of any of the preceding things we spoke of, or on account of anyone. The same thing happens with hate, irrationality, Irrationally loving something and irrationally hating something are both the result of passion. Whether it's hate or love, or positive or negative, or whether I support you or am envious of you, or if it's a feeling of attraction or a feeling of repulsion, it really doesn't matter since they are all expressions of one kind of passion or another. Of course, irrational love is some, somehow worse than hate since it disguises our passions much more effectively than hate does. Whatever I do must be reasonable and not irrational or futile, and all the passions are exercises in futility. Only that which looks to things of substance, to the kingdom of the heavens, is not a passion. How does a passion differ from a vice, and what is a vice? Vice is the mistaken use of our mental representations of things which follows the abuse of the things themselves. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.17. Having a vice means doing the opposite of what you should be doing. A vice is the weakness of the soul in choosing what is correct from among the thoughts and images in the mind. It's not knowing whether I should allow my disciple to do whatever he wants or insist that he does what I tell him. A vice is an error in judgment, an inability to discriminate justly among one's thoughts, such errors are not always sins in the eyes of God, but they are still a vice and at some point or another will result in something evil. Thoughts and mental images are, as a rule, our own. They are generated by our experiences, by things we have learned, and by the way we think, and it is very difficult, if not impossible, to understand or even accept the fact that our way of thinking is mistaken and that our thoughts are based on errors of judgment. This means that we are not able to see our vices. This is why an evil or corrupt person thinks he is good or perfect or even a saint and that he is perfectly suited to teach and even lead others. This is a terrible thing, but it is true. Who can see and understand that his ideas, thinking and judgment are all flawed and mistaken? This is the condition of vice. Vice is the mistaken use of ideas which follows the abuse of things, for example, in what concerns women. When we are mistaken in our judgments concerning the ideas or images of things, we subsequently abuse the things in question. Food, for example, is something that God has given us to sustain our bodies. If, however, I am mistaken in my judgment about it and fall into a state of vice, I'll think that food exists for me to eat as much of it as I want, whenever I can. Why is my stomach growling? Because it's empty, therefore I must eat. This is how we think. But to where does such thinking lead? To the abuse of food. Whereas evil had previously been only something in my mind, now it has materialized in my misuse and abuse of things. The evil in my mind has entered the world. In order to understand this better, St. Maximus gives us an example in what concerns women. Things pertaining to the flesh always have a direct and intensely sensory aspect and are easily understood by everyone, which is why the fathers so often use them as examples. For example, in what concerns women, the proper use of intercourse is for the purpose of procreation. Thus, the one who concentrates on the pleasure is an error as to its use by considering as good what is not good. Therefore, such a person misuses a woman in having intercourse. The same holds true for other objects and mental representations. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.17. What St. Maximus asks is the purpose of conjugal union, the procreation of children. And when someone gets married solely for the sake of carnal pleasure, he is in error. He has made a mistake because this is not what married life is for, but rather for having and raising children. 
If then you get married for the sake of pleasure, you are mistaken in your understanding and judgment of marriage, and you consider good something that is not good, and thus your use of your wife is in fact misuse or abuse. Someone could, however, express a different opinion about this question, inasmuch as one finds among the fathers two different views. In general, the fathers were concerned about the kingdom of heaven, and in a certain manner the- theologized based on their personal spiritual revelations and eschatological experiences. That is, they saw the world as a figure, a prelude, a passageway to the kingdom of God. This is why they always endeavored to raise the human person from earth to heaven. The fathers did not focus their theology on matters pertaining to this world. This is why they did not produce a theology of marriage. They certainly taught marriage and taught things about marriage, but always with an emphasis on raising the human mind from marriage itself to what marriage represents and symbolizes. St. Paul does the same thing when he says that marriage is a great mystery concerning Christ and the church. Ephesians 5.32 He is not speaking about marriage as such, which is his point of departure to talk about the great and awesome mystery of Christ's union with the church. Just as marriage is indissoluble, so too is the relation of Christ and the church, which includes Christ's relation with mankind, which is likewise unfailing, inseparable, and indivisible. Elsewhere, St. Paul takes marriage as a point of departure for teaching self-control, together with fasting and prayer in the life of the husband and wife. Here, too, you can see that his aim is to raise our minds to a higher level. See 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Thus, the things of this life are figures and images, and marriage as an institution of this world is also a figure, which means that it is something that will pass away. Marriage was established because Adam sinned. It was not God who wanted marriage, but rather man who wanted it. Adam fell and God gave him marriage as a gift. This is why the fathers were not greatly preoccupied with marriage. St. John Chrysostom writes beautifully about marriage in his treatise on virginity. But if you read it, you might be more inclined to adopt a life of virginity, which of course was his aim in writing this work. And when the fathers compare virginity with marriage, one says that the two are as far apart as heaven and earth while another might say they are as far apart as God and man, and another might say something else, but they will almost always be looking at marriage as an image or icon of humanity's love for God. This is how the church understands the Song of Songs. This is also the perspective of St. Simeon, the new theologian, and of virtually all the fathers of the church, and not least the ascetic fathers. All of them speak of the mystery of marriage as if it were the most common and well-known image of the kingdom of heaven. But because they did not articulate a theology of marriage, it is not surprising that sometimes they will say that marriage is for procreation, and at other times that marriage was established to avoid fornication, following the words of St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 7, 2. But this is the opposite of what St. Maximus the Confessor is saying in his chapter. At the moment, we are not concerned with which of these views is the more dominant. In any case, we're in a monastery and we're not married. If a person gets married, this will be something for him or her to consider. What concerns us is the essence of the matter. And the essence of the matter is such that having made a mistaken judgment about the idea of it, you will be led to misuse and abuse it, further leading you into a condition of vice and sin. This is exactly why St. Maximus is telling us to keep a close watch over our thoughts to keep our judgment unclouded by error, that is, for our judgment not to be the effect or outcome of vice, or a conclusion drawn from sense perception and not the vision of God. Well, let us move on and complete our discussion of the chapters concerning thoughts and judgment in the second century of St. Maximus's chapters on love. The one who anoints his mind for the sacred contests and drives away impassioned thoughts from it possesses the character of a deacon. The one who illumines the mind with the knowledge of beings and eradicates false knowledge possesses the character of a priest. Finally, the one who perfects the mind with the holy myrrh of knowledge and the worship of the Holy Trinity possesses the character of a bishop. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.21. 
In this chapter, we have three types of people who are using their minds properly. Those who do not use their minds properly are people who have subjected their minds to sensations, vices, and as a result, habitually err in their judgments. Those, on the other hand, who use their minds well are divided into three categories, which we can characterize as beginners, intermediate, and, adv and advanced, which St. Maximus compares to the three grades of the priesthood, deacon, priest, and bishop. Let's see if we belong anywhere on this list, which is to ask if we have attained even the rank of deacon, since the answer is not unimportant. The one who anoints his mind for the sacred contests and drives away impassioned thoughts from it possesses the character of a deacon. If we recall the previous chapters where prayer was said to lead the mind to transcend forgetfulness and ignorance because it introduces the mind into the knowledge of the mysteries of God, we will understand the comparisons and parallels that St. Maximus is making in this chapter. Deacons are those who anoint the mind. What does does it mean to anoint the mind? The meaning of this word is simple and is used frequently in Scripture and the Fathers. To anoint is to cover or mark something with oil. In the ancient world, who was anointed with oil? Athletes, which is why here the anointing is done for the sacred contests, for the one who will train and exercise his mind, for one who is in training for the contest. The one who is anointed then is the one in training. He is the, the one who anoints his mind for the sacred contests and drives away impassioned thoughts from it. His training consists in driving away impassioned thoughts, in casting away the mental images of material things, in disciplining his mind to stay on track, not to wander about aimlessly, but to follow a straight course to God. In this first category, then, are those people who train their minds to think about God, to recollect God and hold him within memory, and at the same time to reject and cast aside all impassioned thoughts. According to St. Basil, this is something that occurs during one's childhood until the age of eight, and it is the first thing that children should learn, or certainly not later than 17, because if these things are not learned by then, the person will have serious problems. If a child learns to run around in the streets, he's not going to sit at home. His mother might punish him for his bad behavior, but he'll be back on the streets at his first opportunity. This is how the human mind is. And this is why St. Basil says that children should be taken to monasteries where they can be taught to discipline their minds. They should be placed in the care of an experienced person who knows about such struggles and who can anoint them for their training. Is it too late for us at our age to train our minds in this way? I don't know, although better late than never. But everyone should take extra care with children whom we all love and are so proud of, so that they do not waste their time or harm themselves during these early foundational years. As for you who are older, God will provide, even though your struggle will be difficult. Some things are best learned at certain ages, and learning in general becomes more difficult with age. If this is true with respect to, say, chemistry and foreign languages, how much more so for these kinds of spiritual contests? But let us not give up or lose hope, because neither the age we live in nor our society helps us, but instead are filled with ignorance and obstacles to a life of virtue. God may take pity on us, see the desire of our hearts, and send us his grace. But this aside, the proper training and formation of the mind is something that occurs at a much younger age. But because St. Maximus does speak of the anointing of the mind, let us commit ourselves to the necessary training and the merciful God will help us. The one who illumines the mind with the knowledge of beings and eradicates false knowledge possesses the character of a priest. A priest or presbyter is the one who acquires knowledge of beings, which means he knows the origin and emergence of beings from God, as well as their role in the divine economy of salvation. The priest illumines his mind by knowing the inner principles of beings, he enters into the essence of things. His mind does not remain on the surface, but enters into the depths. He sees what is hidden in each and every thing, and that God is concealed in each. He recognizes that God made all things, 
and he understands why he made them all and what God's relationship is with each one of them. He has, in other words, the knowledge of beings, not according to sense perception, but according to God. Finally, the one who perfects the mind with the holy myrrh of knowledge and the worship of the Holy Trinity possesses the character of a bishop. A bishop is someone who has attained the level of contemplation and has acquired perfect knowledge. He is anointed with the holy myrrh of perfect knowledge, contemplation, and revelation of God, and he casts off all other forms and kinds of knowledge, including the knowledge of beings and the knowledge of wisdom. This is the summit and perfection of knowledge, the entrance into the mysteries of God, for which the human spirit was created. Such knowledge is the purpose and goal of the human spirit. If it were possible in this life to enter into the mysteries of God, God would not have endowed us with spirit. He would have given it to us in the next life, since we would have had no use for it in this one. But that he gave it to us now means that these mysteries are accessible to us in this life. It follows that whoever has the knowledge of God has God unceasingly and truly before him, which is why St. Maximus speaks of the knowledge and worship of the Holy Trinity. From the diversity of beings, we arrive at the Trinity of persons, whom we know truly and whom we worship. St. Maximus marks out a path of ascent from the very beginning to the end, from the beginning, beginner to the perfect. He wants us to have the true knowledge of God that comes about through revelation, and he wants us always to bow down and worship God in spirit and in truth. Chapter 5. All the words of the Lord contain these four, commandments, dogmas, threats, and promises. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.24 St. Maximus is saying that all the words of the Lord possess four qualities or aspects which he lists in this chapter. What is the meaning of dogma here? Is a dogma something revelatory of God? No. God transcends every thought and cannot be grasped by the mind. He is not an object that we can comprehend or uncover or investigate. Let's say, for example, that I'm poor or sick. My poverty makes me want a certain kind of God who can make me wealthy, or my sickness makes me want a God who can give me health, which the doctors were not able to give me. But God is not like this. He completely transcends this kind of thinking. What then is God? We might say that a particular person is just, strong, powerful, wise, and so on. At the same time, we will also say the same things about God, namely that he is just, strong, powerful, and wise. But in reality, God himself is none of these things, which are qualities and attributes of human experience that we apply to God. Well, someone might say, perhaps God is something like the extension of the human mind to an infinite depth of space and time. No, God is not this either. What then is God? God is that which transcends everything, which includes any kind of analogy we might construct or imagine. Consequently, a dogma is not a concept or formula that has somehow managed to capture and contain the essence of God. To be sure, a God who could be so captured and contained would not be God at all, but merely an extension of man, because human concepts are a projection of human beings. At the same time, there is a sense in which God can be conceptualized in certain ways by the human mind, through the use of reason, through dogmas, through philosophy, and through human experience, again, not according to his essence, but according to his relations with us. One can similarly reflect on the relations among the persons of the Holy Trinity, but here our knowledge tends to be restricted to analogies drawn from human experience, which are always limited. For example, we say that we love, and thus the persons of the Holy Trinity love. A father loves his son, and So how much more, we think, does God the Father love his only begotten Son? But these are all concepts based on and conditioned by human experiences. They are human conceptualizations of God's relations with human beings and not ontological discourses of God as he is in himself. They are not, in other words, statements about God's essence, but about his activities. Strictly speaking, God is neither evil nor good, neither small nor large, for these are relative categories. What is he then? He is that which human beings cannot be, 
For we are always conditioned by relative categories such as better or worse, or smaller or larger. But these cannot be applied to God with respect to his essence, because if we constructed an essential notion of God as great, it would mean that somewhere there existed another God who was greater. Yet we do say that God is great, and that he is good, and many other things like this. That God is great, good, uncreated, indivisible, that he undertook the work of human salvation, that Christ was born, crucified, and many other things all constitute what we call dogmas. A dogma is thus the opening of heaven and the vision of God, who has graciously come down to the level of human beings. It is God on the level of the divine economy of salvation, as he acts in relation to us. Dogmas either flow from the natural revelation of God, or they are revelations that God gave through the prophets, the apostles, and the saints, and which continue through God-bearing human beings. The revelations granted to them, often in a manner that is mystical and beyond comprehension, extend even to the Holy Trinity, as the Lord himself says, No one knows the things of God except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal them. Matthew one twenty seven. Christ, the incarnate Logos, the Word of God, be because he came forth from the bosom of the Father, revealed to us things concerning the Father, concerning himself, and concerning the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit continues the work of revelation in the history of the Church and through the lives of God-bearing human beings. This is how we have knowledge concerning the Holy Trinity, although, as I said, this knowledge is mystical and essentially beyond human comprehension. It is something beyond human logic and constitutes a dogma of the church. Another aspect of the Lord's words are threats, which might strike us as a little odd, but if you think about it for a moment, you'll realize how and why these threats came about. The human person is an unstable creature with respect to the use of his free choice. When God placed the first human beings in paradise, he forbade them to eat from one single tree, warning them, on the day that you shall eat of it, you will die. Genesis 2.17 he, he had also clearly told them that in order to be able to live in paradise, you must eat continually from the tree of life, which means to partake of the life of God. Being free to make their own decisions, however, Adam and Eve had the ability to reject the life of God and to die not simply a physical or biological death, but that death which is separation from God. Thus, when God told them, on the day you shall eat of it, you will die. This was not punishment, but a sign of God's care and providence for them. It's as if he had said to them, you can have whatever you want. Do you want to separate yourself from me? That will happen on the day you eat from that tree. It's as if I were to tell you, don't eat anything from that corner of the garden because it was just sprayed with pesticides. The garden gate is being kept closed as a reminder for you not to go in there. But you are filled with a strong desire to open the gate and eat something from the garden. Then I will say, if anyone wishes to eat from the garden, I'll unlock the gate, that is, the, the door to poison, since this is what you say you want. And think how you would react if, instead of this, I barricaded the gate and strictly forbade anyone to enter. You'd get upset, angry, and a plan a mutiny against me. You'd say, why are you keeping us under lock and key here? This is the human condition, and this is why God has placed limits on the human person, and the first and foremost of these limits is death. Thus, there was no threat hanging over Adam's head, but simply the care and providence of his creator. Death was a limit placed on man, but it was directly related to his freedom. A corollary of his ability to determine the course of his own life, to do whatever he wished, at the same time, the possibility of death was the expression of God's love, since it prevented the fallen human person from living forever in a state of corruption and evil. So there is no threat here, but only later, after the transgression. Why? The first human being was created according to the image and likeness of God. He had the possibility to fall or to say, I will not eat from that tree. After the transgression, however, his will was weakened and he lost his inner stability and now he stumbles about this way and that. What he wants to do, he does not do, and what he hates is the very thing he does. He wants one thing, but does another, 
I want to stop smoking because the doctor told me to stop, but I smoke anyway. I want to stop drinking because it's damaging my health, but I continue to drink. I don't want to go to that bad place or associate with those people, but I'm on my way there right now. This is the deep contradiction that has entered human life. Now that the human person finds himself in this kind of condition, is God going to allow him to utterly destroy himself? No, of course not. He must do something to strengthen men's will, but without intervening in his life. So he provides him with absolute strength and support, giving him the possibility to become one with God and to rely exclusively on his grace. This is how the human person will regain the divine image. This is how he will grow in the likeness of God. This is how he will be divinized. This is how he will partake of divinity and receive divine power. But in order for this to happen, he himself has to desire this and say, God, I want to return to you. As a rule, the human person stands midway between earth and heaven, considering and reconsidering his options. This being the situation and not wishing to intervene directly in his life, what does God do in order to protect him? Since God knows that the time will come when we will fall to the earth, to the flesh, to sin, to the world, and to hell, he hedges us about with threats. But he doesn't say, I will punish you, or I will send you to hell, but rather, if you do this or that, you will be lost, you will fall into evil, you will fall into the hands of demons, you will die, you will enter hell. This is how God threatens him. Why? Because God does not want man to fall into evil, but he wants what is best for him. Yet man is weak, lost, does not know which way to go. And so God warns him about the consequences of his choices and the hope that he might place himself on the right path and do the very thing that he himself wants to do. And in order to strengthen his resolve for the good even more, his resolve for God, he also makes promises as St. Maximus says. This is why the Lord says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 3-5. This is how the Lord encourages us, as if he were saying, Continue to move forward. This is the way to the kingdom of heaven. Just ahead of you are the angels, the saints. Christ is waiting for you and the mother of God too. What man thinks is difficult, God reveals to be easy. Whatever man thinks is easy, God reveals to be a descent into self-destruction. This is how God strengthens man's will without trampling on his freedom, since man remains free to choose good or evil. Thus it is after the fall that God makes threats and promises and says, from this point forward, you will eat your bread in the sweat of your face, and in pain you will give birth to your children. But at the very same time, God also announced to them in advance the good news of the gospel, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. This was the first promise, namely that human beings would be restored to their primal beauty and return to the kingdom of heaven. How beautifully God arranged all things. On the one hand, he issues threats warning man about the extent to which he would be tyrannized by his sin. On the other hand, he promises him that there was a way to true life and joy. In this manner, man's freedom is respected and preserved. And God does not go away, but remains close at hand, running after man no matter where he goes, always ready to respond to every soul that cries out to him. Or rather, there is no need to cry out, since God is so close to us, already holding us, in his embrace. And for the sake of these, we patiently endure every hardship, such as fastings, vigils, sleeping on the ground, hard work, toil in the service of others, outrages, disgrace, tortures, death, and the like. For as the scripture says, for the sake of the words of your lips, I have kept the ways that are hard. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.24 and Psalm 16, 4. Elder Amelia Nos continues, In order for a person to follow and apply God's commandments and believe in his dogmas and teachings, in order to avoid the threats and attain the promises, he patiently endures every hardship. 
St. Maximus provides us with a list of nine such hardships, but of course there are many more. While many of these are directly relevant to monastic life, it should be understood that toil in the service of others includes the time and labor that a husband devotes to his wife and the time and labor that a wife devotes to her husband. Also mentioned are things like torture and death, to which we could add things like dishonorable treatment, lies, betrayals, false accusations, just to mention a few. But are these things really hardships? When a person feels the harsh weight and pain of these things, it means that there is a second kind of contradiction in his soul. This is because these things appear to be harsh only to someone who looks at them with human eyes, from a human perspective. This is why the psalmist says, For the sake of the words of your lips, I have kept ways that are hard. That is, ways that seem hard to the many. The person on a spiritual path does not experience these things as harsh, but rather as good things, as blessings. The monk who sleeps on the ground is more comfortable than someone who sleeps in a bed. He doesn't say, how am I going to keep all these fasts? Because fasting becomes the most natural thing for him. Only a person whose internal contradictions have reached an advanced state, whose inner psychological world has been so compromised that his will is confused and unstable will see these things as unbearable hardships. We patiently endure every hardship. Patient endurance does not mean simply putting up with something, but enduring it patiently. Thus, we endure every difficulty and hardship voluntarily, in this way expressing our expectation and anticipation of God's providence and help. I sleep on the ground, for example, not because I am forbidden to sleep on a bed, but because this is how I express my love and desire for God. In general, I reject conventions and compromises, that is, whatever is earthly. I have the right to eat meat, but I choose not to, setting aside human conventions because of my desire to be united with God. I have the right to protect my life, to maintain my body and my health, but I voluntarily engage in long periods of fasting. Why? Because I don't want to live in this world, but with Christ, and I have the right to leave this world behind and move toward him. To embrace hardships, then, is to cast aside all social conventions, human compromises, and accommodations that weakened and undermined my life in God. It is the complete freedom from every human element, from every societal bond. And who can deny that life in the world is marked by great unfreedom? So I reject all these things and say, God, I am yours. I want to live on earth in freedom, which includes freedom from the demands of my body, a body which is completely mine, but which has the possibility to completely, to be completely spiritualized. I want to be one with you, to be raised to the level of your life and your divinity. This is how hardships need to be seen, and this is their meaning and significance, namely that I accept no compromises, no expedient accommodations, but rather do the opposite of what a person bound to the flesh does, the opposite of what the world does in all of its endless compromises. Why? To express the fact that I do nothing but wait patiently for God. The patient endurance of every hardship is the true spiritual form of life. It is assimilation to the life of the angels, since it marks the transcendence of everything earthly, of everything transient. This is why, for example, I do not place emphasis on food and eating, since all of this will pass away. And I eat only as much as I need to live. And I do not eat with the idea of making an idol of my health and living a long life, but eat only as much as I need to live today, right now. This is also why I do not get married, because the one day marriage too will come to an end. My wife will die, and I will become unable to bear children. This is why I embrace a life of virginity, which is incorruptible. This is why we say that a virgin has been corrupted. But I do not want to suffer corruption. I want to remain incorrupt and abide eternally with God. The hardships we patiently endure are the signs and images of our life in eternity. They are the things that will bring us to the kingdom of heaven. Through our patience, we will be ushered into the presence of the Lord, which is why the psalmist says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard me. 
Psalm 39, 2. Our eyes are turned, always turned toward him, like the eyes of servants, which are always turned to the hands of their master. Psalm 122, verse 2. Of course, it happens sometimes that a spiritual father or abbot has to instruct his disciples to be careful about the way they fast, so that they will be able to continue to fast tomorrow and the next day. He will encourage them to eat. This is because fasting has a particular aim or end. And if someone is fasting solely for the sake of fasting or out of misplaced enthusiasm or because other people are fasting or to punish himself or for any other reason except for the canonical reason, then this is something dangerous. Fasting, like all things, has to be done in the right way and at the right time. Fasting requires a degree of spiritual maturity, just as all things do. If you do things without the proper guidance, awareness, or maturity, you will probably run into problems, such as harming yourself from excessive fasting, and then you will blame Christ and the church. But you are not listening to Christ. You are listening to your own thoughts and following your own impulses. Every excess and exaggeration can be the means to self-destruction if you are not careful or don't know what you're doing. If an elder sees a disciple lacking knowledge and the necessary maturity, or if he sees him falling into excessive or extreme behaviors, he is required to do what a shepherd does when he sees a wolf, namely to protect the flock, raise his voice and say, what you're doing is wrong and your extreme fasting today will prevent you from fasting tomorrow and the next day. What seems so simple, like fasting, is not simple at all, since it is not dieting but a spiritual practice, and it comes with many presuppositions. It is good to fast, and for those under spiritual direction, to fast even to the point of weakening the body. But for us to do this means we have to understand the nature and ultimate purpose of fasting. The reward of self-mastery is freedom from the passions, and that of faith is knowledge, and freedom from the passions gives birth to discernment, while knowledge gives birth to the love for God. St. Maximus, the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.25. St. Maximus is saying that the reward of self-mastery, or self-control, is freedom from the passions, or dispassion, which is a gift, a charisma, given by God to man. Dispassion cannot exist without self-control, but self-control by itself does not bring about dispassion or freedom from the passions. If this were true, we would have a kind of dualism in which the body or the flesh were somehow evil and needed to be placed under subjection in order for man to be free. Let's say, for example, you have temptations of the flesh and you try to eliminate them by subduing the flesh. The problem with this approach is that the flesh is not the source of these temptations, which are rooted in the soul. Neither is their source the person you see, but rather is concealed within yourself. It's your fault that you're being tempted. It is not the fault of anyone else. What then is self-mastery or self-control? It is an expression of my thought, my desire, my decision to be liberated from the passions. When I want you to give me something, I'll hold out my open hand in supplication. When I want you to show you how much I love you, I'll embrace you and kiss you. The embrace and the kiss are expressions of my love. In a similar way, self-mastery is the expression of my desire for a life liberated from the passions. Again, it is not that self-mastery itself liberates us from the passions. No more than holding out my open hand will suddenly fill it with money. You have to want to give me the money. And God gives his gifts to the person who desires them, who longs for them, because God sees human beings according to their desires. He is the one who examines our hearts. And to the extent that a person's heart expresses the desire for dispassion, God gives him what he is seeking. God's response to man's desire is, in a way, God's journey to man, God's movement towards man. The reward of self-mastery is freedom from the passions. Do you want to be free of the passions? It is very simple. Exercise control over yourself. But do this as expressing your desire, your longing, and not thinking that you, through your own efforts, are going to overcome your weakness or your ego or anything else like this. You can't overcome anything. 
No matter how long a pig rolls around in clean grass, it will always remain a pig. And no matter how long you exercise self-control, you'll always remain a person cast into sins and having every manner of darkness within yourself. Against these things, asceticism by itself does nothing. God himself must come to free your soul and to remove from it whatever evil and darkness is clouding it. So I undertake all these efforts, patiently awaiting, as we said a moment ago, for God, and all the while telling him, God, I am nothing. It is you who must liberate me from the passions. What is dispassion? In the beginning, it is the inactivity of the passions that exist within me. At a later stage, dispassion progresses, by which I mean that God progresses and becomes an actual uprooting of the passions. In the same way that my mind is emptied, remaining free and open and awaiting the arrival of God, so too is my soul emptied of every evil, down to the very root, so that I no longer bear within myself the basic element of the passions, which is sin. For example, I see a certain woman, and immediately a carnal desire enters my mind. This carnal desire does not come from the woman, but rather from the passion that exists within me, which wants to smile at her and move closer to her, and which sets me moving on the path of sin. However, now that I have been freed from the passions, I no longer respond to her with disordered desires. There is no longer any corresponding negative activity in my soul, no longer the potential for something to happen. It's like a switch that opens a door. If the switch is gone, if it is not operative, then the door won't open. In the same way, things around me will no longer stir up thoughts within me or lead me to sin if the passions are no longer operating within me. Now that I have acquired dispassion, now that the root of passion is no longer living within me, I am free of the passions and I can say, look at this beautiful human being. I no longer see an attractive or beautiful woman or an unattractive or homely one, but simply a human being. I no longer have the passions active within myself. I no longer think or act based on impulses coming from the passions. I am no longer a slave to impassioned impulses. I have become completely inactive, dead to anything evil. The reward of faith is knowledge. What does faith mean here? What is knowledge? Faith is the presence, the taking form, the actualization of something that exists or which will exist, but which is not visible. Blessed are those who have not seen and believed, says the Lord. John twenty twenty nine. Hope is the substance of something hoped for, which I hope will come about. I hope that I will attain the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven exists, but for me it will be a reality in eternity. This is something I believe, something I have faith in. I hope that God will cure me of my illness. But I can't say I'm hoping for God. I believe in God. I have faith in God because God is present. When we say I hope in God, we mean that I hope that God will give me something that I want. Both faith and hope are extensions of the self toward God in the present, but for the sake of the future. They are things which unfold in a perspective oriented toward the future. Often we say, I have faith that this or that will happen, instead of saying, I hope this or that will happen. We're not always aware of the meanings of the words we use, or we are careless and use them inappropriately, improperly. The verb to believe refers to the knowledge of, of the love and power of God. To know something is to believe it, to have faith in it. Lord, I believe that you will do this for me, and thus I hope for the moment when it will come about. Belief refers to God, who can do whatever he wishes to do, while hope refers to that which will come about for me. Belief or faith exists. Hope is something that will be realized in the future. What is love? It is the complete inclination and turning of the whole person toward God. It is union with him in the presence, in the present, which will continue to unfold and which will be perfected in the age to come. This is what it means when I say, I love God. And what is knowledge? Through faith, something that I cannot see becomes present to me. I cannot see it, but I believe in it. 
Do I see the Holy Trinity? No. Do I understand that the Holy Trinity is a unity? Do I understand how the Son came down from heaven and lived on the earth without ever leaving the Father? No. I do not understand this. I believe it. Thus, knowledge is the spiritual vision of a mystery. It is my entry into the mystery and the revelation of the mystery to my mind. This revelation of God is what St. Maximus is here calling knowledge. When we have the kind of faith that St. Maximus is talking about, which is a gift from God, then God gives us another gift, namely knowledge of mysteries, which is a gift added to faith. This kind of knowledge we call divine knowledge because it is knowledge of God. Is such knowledge possible for a human being? Certainly. Why did God create us? Was it so he could tyrannize us and keep us in the dark? No, not at all. When a person believes that he can acquire this kind of knowledge and when he truly desires and pursues such knowledge in the proper manner, by which I mean according to the commandments, then God freely gives it to him. Without these things, God does not impart the gift of knowledge. Belief or faith is the opening of the eyes of the soul, which can occur over a period of time because one's faith can grow. Every new addition continues to be faith, but it is faith that has grown in its experience and maturity. We progress from faith to faith and from understanding to understanding. What we are cultivating within ourselves remains the same, but as it grows and produces fruit, we learn to cultivate it in new ways and nothing is ever finished or perfect in this life. All things have their limits and will be perfected only in the kingdom of God. And freedom from the passions gives birth to discernment. Here we need to pay attention, since St. Maximus does not say that the reward of dispassion is discernment, but that the dispassion gives birth to discernment. Discernment is the opposite of vice, which is a lack of proper judgment. It is a failure to discern the will of God. But when my soul is pure, when the eye of my mind sees clearly, when I do not lose my focus by being dragged about here and there, when my spiritual vision is not darkened or distorted by the passions, then I can see all things clearly. Someone else, however, who has not been freed from the passions suffers from something like spiritual myopia. His vision is blunted, limited, and he sees everything in the wrong way and so falls away from the truth. When I do not see things clearly, then I am not able to understand the truth or depth of what is going on around me, and I will not know how to respond or what to do. But when I am freed from the passions, then I have certainty about things, and I understand immediately what I need to do. Let's say, for example, I'm sitting somewhere, and I sense that something has struck me. What was it? How could I possibly know? If I am filled with passions, but whoever is pure will immediately understand if it was the devil or a trick of the mind or something resulting from bodily illness. Another example, I like someone or have feelings of love for someone. Is this love pure or not? What are my reasons and motivations for liking or loving this person? You can't know since the intensity of your desire makes you think that your love is perfectly pure, but the dispassionate person knows Discernment and the certainty that accompanies it is the fruit of dispassion. Knowledge gives birth to love for God. Why does knowledge give birth to love for God? Does this mean that if you lack knowledge, you are unable to love God? You can certainly long for the love of God, as St. Maximus said earlier, but in order to love God, you have to know him. You wouldn't marry someone you didn't know or whom you had never seen or only spoken with on the phone a few times. It's only after you come to know someone that you can think about the possibility of marrying that person. It's the same way with God. As we said earlier, love for God is complete and perfect union with God, complete and perfect marriage to God, a mystical coupling and encounter. It is my divinization in which me and God are mingled together. It is the surrender of myself to God, the submerging of myself in God, we do not become one flesh and spirit, but rather one simple thing, a common identity in God, which requires the loss of my being. Of course, my personal ex existence remains. I do not lose my personhood, but my will, my desire, my power to act, 
all these things are identified with God. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Galatians 2.20 This is something tremendous. A full and complete marriage is conducted with God, of which every earthly marriage is but a shadow, and of which virginity is a prefiguration. How can I progress toward such a marriage without love? I cannot, for it is love that unites me to God. Love is the unifying element. It is the commingling of two persons, Christ and man. But how will this come about if I do not see or love God? Perfect love is the love of those who are perfect, who have seen God. And this seeing is an opening of the soul's eyes to God, which is knowledge. To those who are not perfect, God grants a degree of knowledge, greater or lesser, to every human being. And this is a form of wisdom, not knowledge, an opening of the mind. It is a form of spiritual illumination and a feeling of joy. It is something I feel within myself. This gives me a measure of knowledge of God, and this knowledge gives me a sense of love for God. To be sure, it is not full or complete, but it is a love for God and a relationship with Him varying in degree from person to person. Arriving at love, we arrive at fullness. Now we can say, love God and do whatever you please. When you love God, you are subject to no law because you have become one with God and your life is hidden in God with Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.3 3. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 The mind has succeeded in the life of ascetic practice advances in prudence. The mind that has succeeded in contemplation advances in knowledge. The goal of the former is to bring the one who struggles to the discernment of vice and virtue, while the goal of the latter is to lead the participant to the inner principles of incorporeal and corporal realities. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.26. Elder Emilianos continues, While following the way of ascetic practice in order to encounter God, one arrives at prudence and continues to progress. Prudence is the capacity of the human soul to perceive the world intensely and spiritually, enabling the person to live in the world with spiritual ease, that is, in the manner that God wishes. The contemplative way, on the other hand, leads one to knowledge. Knowledge raises the mind to a certain level, in a certain way, so that God can reveal himself to the mind. Knowledge here is not the acquisition of information or the accumulation of data, but is real participation in the life of God. It is not the activity of man, but the activity of God, who makes man a participant in the inner principles of incorporeal and corporal realities. When you intend to theologize and speak about God, do not seek the principles of God's being, for neither the human mind nor that of any other human after God can discover them. Rather, consider as you can the things around God, for example, his eternity, immensity, infinity, his goodness, wisdom, and his power that creates, governs, and judges creatures. Among human beings, a person is a great theologian to the extent that he searches out the principles of these things, however much or little. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.27 if you intend to speak about God, he says, don't search after the principles of God's being, which means don't seek to understand the essence of God, which is beyond comprehension. In ordinary language, to theologize means to speak or talk about God. But in fact, the word means to enter into communion with God. When then you wish to communicate with God, do not try to know God's essence, because God is essentially unapproachable, incomprehensible, and im participle. No human mind can discover them. Neither can any other being created by God and created beings is what is meant by things after or subsequent to God. The human mind, however, can follow and see and enter into the things around God, which refer to God's attributes and energies which are accessible to us. If we want to take the verb to theologize in an, the ordinary sense, that would be fine. But for St. Maximus, it has a purely and absolutely 
the sense of apprehending the things around God, which refers to God's self-expression, the way he discloses himself to me, bows down and bends over me, and at the same time how I understand him, because God uses a language that I can understand. Whatever I understand, whatever I comprehend, is what God chooses to reveal to me. Whatever capacity my mind has, whatever it is able to apprehend, this is what God will manifest to me. God is the one who, as it were, departs from himself, goes outside himself in order to draw near to man, and he continually pours himself out in time. With this, we have the Lord as one who acts, one who reveals himself through his activities, and this is how we understand his eternity, immense, immensity, infinity, goodness, wisdom, and creative power. We will not concern ourselves now with all these, since we have already commented on most of them. Among human beings, a person is a great theologian to the extent that he searches out the principles of these things, however much or little. Whoever can discover, even in a small way, the attributes and energies of God is truly a great theologian. Again, this means that God is not something to which you can draw near. You are not able to endure that. It is rather God who comes to you, extending himself outward, drawing near to your mind, leading it up upwards and taking it to himself. When this occurs, we have true participation in God. Theology attains to knowledge, which is the outcome of contemplation. And contemplation is the most basic element of our spiritual life, for it is an immediate relationship with God. You can see that theology is not so much the effort or result of human logic, but rather reflects the human capacity to contain and comprehend God. We endeavor to contain God to the extent that God offers himself to us, which of course depends on how much we are able and willing to contain him. Theology is not about pondering this and thinking about that, and then drawing this or that conclusion, but instead it is about being absorbed within the divine energies, and communing with God. After this, St. Maximus says the following. He is a powerful man who joins knowledge to ascetic practice. For by the latter he extinguishes lust and subdues anger, and by the former he gives wings to the mind and makes it fly away to God. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.28. Elder Emilianos continues. Because the confessor had previously spoken about ascetic practice and contemplation, that is about the two ways through which one can be united to God, he now completes this idea and says that the strong or powerful man is the one who unites knowledge to practice. Why does he speak of joining knowledge to practice and not practice to knowledge? Because ascetic practice is something we do on a daily basis, whereas knowledge is the essential element which in a certain manner leads the human person upwards. Knowledge is that which conveys and offers us to God himself, while ascetic practice is what we do every day. Of course, our practice is not simply the application of certain principles, but constitutes our ethical and moral life, our way of being in the world, and our wisdom. It is an embodied form of diversified knowledge in the ordinary sense of this term. Our practice is also a form of prayer, it is everything that constitutes our daily life here in the monastery, our identity in Christ, which constitutes our experience of God in this life and in this world. But the strong, strong is the person who is not satisfied with practice alone, who recognizes that it, it is an incomplete, and who asks God to reveal to him and open his mind to divine and ineffable mysteries. By the latter, he extinguishes lust and subdues anger. Through our practice, we are at every moment in a position to receive God. Ascetic practice is the daily preparation we undertake in our lives. It is the context, the atmosphere we create for ourselves. But by itself, it does not bring us into communion with God. How then does ascetic practice prepare us? By extinguishing our selfish and disordered desires and by taming and subduing our anger. Lust is disordered desire. And we have already spoken about this many times. The phrase, it extinguishes lust, does not mean that you strike your body and that's how you extinguish or wither your desire. Because as we said, lust is the reflection of a passion and only God can extinguish a passion. 
Only he can remove lustful desire from our hearts. That ascetic practice extinguishes lust means that such practice allows and enables God to enter our life. Now God can touch our inner world and purify it, removing those elements that make it difficult for us to perceive and know him. Fallen, disordered desire works in such a way as to unite ourself to something or someone else. It is the cleaving of my whole being to something other than God. It is the exile of God and my, the occupation of my heart by another God. It is the identification of my being with the object of my desire, with that which I feel so intensely in my life, which I want and long for and feel I can't live without. Ascetic practice withers this false and self-centered desire, removing the false idols from the sanctuary of my heart. And subdues anger. Anger or wrath or the spirited and aggressive power of the soul, is something we considered in the second and twelfth chapters. It is a deep and primal force within the human soul. The soul is in constant contact and communion with everything around it. Through the senses of the body, the soul senses and feels intensely whatever is around it, and to such a great extent that we identify ourselves with whatever it is that has filled and occupied our soul through the senses. Anger is simply the possession or occupation of the self by something that is not the self. Whereas desire is an outward movement of the self toward an object and a voluntary identification with it. Anger is the entry of the object into the soul and identification with it. Even more so, anger is an embodiment of desire on the level of an idea. In other words, desire becomes an idea, a palpable force of determination, a kind of conviction and an intense feeling. Anger, as the spirited aspect of the soul, recapitulates the entire capacity of the person to feel something with extraordinary intensity in a dark, negative sensuality. As St. Maximus says, ascetic practice is able to calm and subdue the spirited aspect of the soul. It renders us peaceful, which means to be free from views and opinions, and to not react with spiritual violence to things and events taking place around us. Instead of the upheavals caused by anger, conflict, and violence, we live in boundless peace, tranquility, and freedom. We are no longer slaves to the impulses of desire and anger, no longer at the mercy of desire and fallen sensuality, and enter a state of blessed ignorance regarding the things of the world, and thus we are able to be filled with the knowledge of God. Knowledge gives wings to the mind and makes it fly away to God. As we said, knowledge here is not a form of knowledge or wisdom, but rather an experiential drawing near to God. And thus it is natural to describe this as the soul acquiring wings and soaring aloft to God. It's like when you get close to someone and you feel you could easily spend all your time with that person. The same thing happens with the mind. The human mind seeks to return to the first mind, to God, because God is the mind's natural companion, as if they were related by blood. Through knowledge, the mind is raised to God and takes its place with God. The ascent of the mind, the noose that is, as if it had wings, is man's departure from this world to God, because the spirit of man and man are the same thing. The spirit is the pure, more spiritual, more internal, truer element of human existence. Through the gift of these wings and through the mind's ascending movement toward God, the human person makes his progressive upward turn to God. The person is no longer fixed or static, as if he were still enclosed within the framework of ascetic practice, but has now left the earth and is in motion toward God. This is what St. Maximus means by flying away, which signifies a departure from the world from one's context and routine, from oneself in a straight upward ascent, which is a continual drawing near to and touching of God. This is the cleaving to God that we spoke about earlier, an orientation to the next life, to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the person's life becomes eschatological. It ceases to have a present as it enters into the infinity and timelessness of life with God. This is the state and condition of the perfect human being. Think about the human person, whom God has called and destined for this great work, which is to rise above this world and move toward God, 
to rise above himself and to enter the infinite space of God, to commune with the persons of the Holy Trinity, and to discover his own personhood in the Holy Spirit. Now think about what it would be like if he were to reject such a calling and prefer to live a simple, ordinary, earthly life. If he were to turn away from God and cling to his misery, his endless complaining, his selfish desires, his petty demands, his irritability, his mean-spirited words, and all the other things that make up his fallen life. What a great tragedy and injustice. How could one even begin to express the wretchedness of such a life? It's as if he were born into a royal family, yet chose to clothe himself in filthy rags. St. Maximus challenges us on all sides and manages to open our minds, which so far have yet to rise even two feet above the ground. Of course, he was named the confessor for other reasons, but let the reason for us be because he confesses to us the depths of God. The one who is perfect in love and has reached the summit of dispassion knows no distinction between his own and another's, between faithful and unfaithful, between slave and freeman, or indeed between male and female, having risen above the tyranny of the passions and looking to the one nature of man, he regards all equally and is equally disposed toward all. For him there is neither Greek nor Jew, neither male nor female, neither slave nor free man, but Christ is everything in everything. Galatians 3.28 St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love 2.30 Yeranda Milianos continues, The one who is perfect, having transcended the passions, no longer distinguishes what is his own and what is foreign, between what belongs to him and what does not belong to him, because he himself has ceased to exist as an isolated, autonomous ego. Neither does he distinguish between things and beings, because he has been poured out within God. He has become completely one with God and is completely free. To be sure, he is able to see who is faithful and who is unfaithful. But his love transcends the distance between the two. And being both the faithful and unfaithful person, he sees a creature of God and the whole of human nature in its totality. Behind the man and the woman, he sees the image of God, which in his case has been cleansed and purified so that it shines brilliantly and is lost in the greater light of God, of the God who is love and who through love emptied himself and who empties himself every day. St. Maximus begins this chapter with the phrase, quote, the one who is perfect in love and has reached the summit of this passion, end quote, because he wants to open up to us the entire breadth of love. The breadth of love has everything to do with the presuppositions necessary for love to exist in the first place. One such presupposition, as we have said, is dispassion or freedom from the passions. It is not possible for someone to love if he is not free of the passions. St. Maximus has been saying this since the very beginning. Dispassion is obviously not simple, simply the inactivity of the passions, but their complete and utter absence. The elimination from within us of every movement, impulse, and inclination of the mind toward any kind of passion because if our mind is not free of the passions, but possesses an impassioned inclination or is filled with some kind of content, then what fills the mind reveals an attachment to something, which means we are not free. This is clear in what St. Maximus says right after this, namely that one has reached the summit of dispassion, which obviously refers to a state of complete and perfect dispassion. In other words, he is not speaking of a purified heart, but of something beyond this, that is, of the dispassion which comes about after such purification, in particular the dispassion of the mind, because this is what is meant by the summit. Thus, the one who is perfect in love is the one who is completely without attachments, who is utterly immovable in relation to the passions, who never loses himself in something that he is not. His mind is no longer involved in projecting impassioned concepts onto objects, situations, or other people for the simple reason that he has nothing to project. He is empty, pure, and inactive with respect to mental images and fantasies. Whoever has reached this state knows no distinction between his own and another's, 
between faithful and unfaithful, between slave and freeman, and indeed between male and female. The phrase knows no distinction means he does not recognize or perceive differences between people. Obviously, this does not mean he does not understand such differences or that he somehow does not see that this person is a man or that this person is a woman in the same way that St. Paul was not incapable of seeing slavery, which he did not abolish, but accepted. Thus, one cannot say that to know no distinction signifies the abolishing of differences and distinctions, but rather that the person himself has reached the level of perfect dispassion. It means that such a person does not register or respond to these differences. He does not experience them like other people do. It is worth noting that the Greek verb to know literally means to quote, stand next to someone or something, which means that such a person in this instance does not take his stand, as it were, on any of these particulars. It's the very opposite of when you like someone and you always want to have them close to you so you can enjoy their presence, feel that they are totally yours, which means you are making a distinction between that person and everyone else. But the one who knows no such distinctions does not make these kinds of essential distinctions. He does not stand closer to some people than others. That you happen to be male or female is mere information to such a person. It is not something that conditions the way his being responds and relates to the world because he's no longer seeing the world through the filter of his passions. He knows no distinction between his own and another's. He does not feel, sense, or experience any difference between what is his own and what is foreign to him because he himself has become a foreigner, estranged, as it were, from his own self. Thus nothing is foreign to him, and yet nothing is his own. He does not see or experience things as his own because he has been freed from his attachments to them, and indeed not just to some things, but to everything. Otherwise, he would not have reached the summit of dispassion. If he had something that he considered his own, this would already be the sign of a passion. Henceforth, he holds nothing as his own because all things are foreign to him. Yet they are not foreign, for inasmuch as all things are God's, they are also his, inasmuch as he exists in God. That he knows no distinction between his own and another's means that all things are his and at the same time are foreign to him. They have no significance to him. He possesses all things, loves all things, but is free from all things because he lives wholly and completely only with God or between faithful and unfaithful. The inner state of dispassion extends to all beings and all creatures of God. The one who is perfect in love certainly knows that he himself is faithful and that someone else is unfaithful, but he has no attachment to that person. He enters into no relationship with him. He neither judges him nor places him in any kind of category. Neither does he organize his life around the fact that this or that person is faithful or unfaithful. The just and the unjust, faithful and unfaithful, worthy and un unworthy alike are all his and are all foreign to him, because for him they are all united in God. He knows no difference between male and female. He has no particular awareness of gender, which he has moved beyond, because all men and women to him are like angels. This lack of awareness, this effective ignorance, is itself freedom from the passions. He is bound to nothing, enslaved to nothing, he inclines towards nothing, holds no opinions and makes no judgments because the difference between male and female, like all differences, corresponds to nothing passionate within him. Because his soul contains no impassioned content, there is nothing that can tempt him or disturb him. When we are tempted by something, let's say, for example, because you're a woman and I'm a man, or because you're a man and I'm a woman, and a temptation enters my mind, this reveals that we are not free of the passions and that we do not love God. If I have intense feelings for someone else, feelings that generate tension or temptation within me, or if I am overwhelmed and feel overtaken by the sight of someone else, or if I have emptied myself out to another, all are signs that the soul is in the grip of a passion and consequently not in communion with God. But the dispassionate person is not affected by temptations, for he is empty and at the same time filled by God. He has risen above the tyranny of the passions. Nothing binds him, nothing divides his soul into fragments, 
Nothing exerts an attraction to his mind because he exists on a level above the passions. For a person to love God, it is not sufficient simply to restrain the passions through asceticism, fasting, and vigils, which are all introductory practices. In addition to these, he must rise above every passion and reach a state of dispassion. When this happens, he loves God being in the same state as Adam when God placed him in paradise, regaining the likeness of God that Adam lost in the fall. He is transformed by grace, fulfilled through God's dispensation for salvation, through which God achieved his purpose. The word became flesh for him, taking human nature to himself and restoring its likeness to God. To have risen above the tyranny of the passions means he has returned to the former beauty of Adam in paradise. It means he has acquired what was lost. He has rediscovered communion with God and now can walk together with God, speak to God and converse with him, listen to him and enjoy the fullness of divine communion. He looks to the one nature of man. When a person reaches this state of dispassion, this degree of communion with God, then through the grace and illumination of God, he understands the one nature of man. In other words, he perceives the unity of all human beings in one nature, despite their differences as particular persons. But he is not attached to personal conditions, free, slave, male, female, but goes deeper than these differences to what unites them all which is the one human nature that God created and assumed in the incarnation. Because God did not assume this or that particular human hypostasis, but he assumed human nature and united it to his own hypostasis, to his own person. I too then must come to understand the unity of human nature, which God assumed, so that I may be united to God in my own hypostasis and complete my own personhood. God took human nature and thus revealed to us the person of God, the Word. And now, because I experienced the revelation of human nature, the unified element of human nature that God assumed, I also received the revelation of God who was united to it, because I too am that human nature. At the same time, the truth of my own person is revealed, and I become the person who becomes like God, assimilated to God, the Word, just as He became human assimilating himself to me by taking human nature to himself. Human nature is one, and all human beings together constitute a single nature. Thus, when St. Maximus says that there is no longer male or female, slave or freeman, he does not mean that these differences do not exist or that the church abolishes them or wishes to do away with them. Instead, it means he does not remain on the level of these differences, but goes much deeper. Only when we reach the unity of human nature can we understand the unity of the divinity and vice versa. This is how we discover our fullness and indeed our very selves. St. Maximus continues and says, quote, For him there is neither Greek nor Jew, neither male nor female, neither slave nor freeman, but Christ is everything in everything. Galatians 3.28 He no longer looks at them as separate ex existences, but as members of the body of Christ, because Christ is everything in everything, which means all things in everyone. This does not mean that Christ is inside of everything, but rather that all these things are Christ, that all of these different kinds of people find their identity, their hypostases, their place, only in their communion with the body of Christ, the mystical body of the church. The person who is perfect in love no longer sees differences between slaves and freemen or between male and female, but sees that all things are Christ and that Christ is in all. They are not separate, autonomous existences. They are Christ. They exist just as Christ exists. They are revealed and discovered. They stand and make progress and grow in the fullness of life in as much as they are Christ, in as much as they are in communion with Christ. A person learns to see things truly when he learns to see God united to human nature. Christ is everything in everything, all things in everyone. How then can I be scandalized by you when you are Christ, when you are a member of my own body? If I am scandalized by you, if I do not feel that you are a member of my own body, it means that I am not being assimilated to God. I am not being 
divinized. I am not free of the passions, but instead I am still just a sinful human being. Thus, scandals do not come about through the observation of gender or other human differences, but from my own imperfection, from my own prolonged lingering in the realm of the passions. The passions are manifested and operated and operate because of me. The same thing happens when I distinguish the slave from the freeman, or what belongs to me and what belongs to you. But as we said, nothing exists except Christ. There are three things that move us to the good, natural tendencies, the holy powers, and a good will. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.32. Someone might think that the holy powers mentioned here are human powers or potentials, but in fact they are holy minds, that is, the holy angels and the saints, too, who invisibly but powerfully influence us because it is God himself who is active and operating within them. Among the three things that move us to the good, a good will is the basic foundation, the presupposition, which is why St. Maximus placed it last. If good will is lacking, then nothing will ever happen. The natural tendencies are the capacities we have by nature, given to us by God for movement toward the good, which, as we said, depends on the orientation and disposition of our will. The holy powers are the spiritual world in which God has placed us and which is the essential element of human life. Not the visible world, but the invisible one, which nourishes and strengthens us, and which exerts a positive influence on us. In this chapter, St. Maximus is telling us what God placed within us, what he created for us, and what we give to God. After this, he says the following. Likewise, there are three things that move us to evil, the passions, the demons, and a bad will. St. Maximus the Confessor, Chapters on Love, 2.33. What moves us to evil, Yerande Emilianos, continues and concludes. First, the passions. The passions are the opposite of the natural tendencies and potentials that God placed within us. From the beginning, God made these tendencies a constitutive part of human nature so that human beings have the natural desire to know the good along with all the other good and natural potentials that we receive. The passions are the opposite of these. God did not create the passions, but men fell into them through his transgression. God created the former. Man suffered the latter. Second, the demons. Demons did not come into existence because of God. What is the proof of this? The fact that whereas he calls the angels holy powers, he does not call the demons evil powers, but rather demons. In order to make this distinction as clear as possible, demons were once angels, and angels, the holy powers, were created by God. But just as the human passion came about because of human beings through the self-chosen fall of man, so too did the demons arise from their self-chosen fall, which was the fall of some of the holy powers. Both instances were the result of the evil inten intention of free will. Third, a bad will. Like the passions, a bad will was not created by God. Just as the passions do not have their own substance or essence, and just as demonic energy does not have a substance or essence, but is rather the denial and rejection of the holiness of the holy powers, for the demons are demonic powers. Neither does a bad will have a substance or an essence. Strictly speaking, it does not have its own proper existence since it was not something created by God, but exists parasitically on the good as the activity of fallen man. The holy powers are primarily the angels, but also the saints, since they have an immediate relationship to the angels. Everything happens with the help of the holy angels, which is why in the Compline service, we pray not to grieve our guardian angel and ask that he not abandon us. The human mind and the larger spiritual world which includes the angels, exists in a close relationship, in a close kinship to each other because of the unity of the body of Christ. There's a difference, though. God actualizes the good. We receive the good, and the holy powers cooperate with God in the actualization of the good. Thus, whatever God created has substance, or as we say, hypostasis. 
And because God is good, the good too exists as something real and substantive. The angels and the goodness of angels exist substantially, but the passions and the bad will of human beings do not exist substantially. They are but the shadows of things that exist. Neither does the evil of the demons exist as a proper substance. It is simply the insistence of the demon to deny and reject the good. If a demon could repent, it would immediately become an angel. But the demons do not repent and instead remain steadfast in their rejection of the good, which is why God has closed off to them the possibility of repentance. Thus, the activities and works of the demons lack substance or hypostases, even though the demons themselves as fallen angels exist as spiritual entities. The demonic rejection of God and the inability of demons to repent are eternal. From the moment the demons fell, their fall was eternal. If this were not the case, God would not have cast them out of heaven, but would have awaited their repentance as he awaited the repentance of fallen man. Throughout the ages, God did nothing else except arrange things to bring about the return of fallen man. How much more would he have done this in the case of the fallen angels? But their repentance and return was not possible. What the demons themselves made impossible by their own decision, God made permanent. And after the ascension, he gave the holy angels a gift, the immutability of their will in relation to evil. Angels can no longer become demons. Many people wonder how the devil thought he could become something greater than himself, indeed equal to God, but it was the result of his pride and ego. The devil was originally a holy power created by God, and thus his natural place and function was to turn toward God. There came a moment, however, when he said, Why should I turn toward you, God? That is, he wanted to project himself place himself at the center. This happened to the devil, and it happens to man. But because the devil was a spirit and had full and complete knowledge of what he was doing, it was not possible for him afterwards to repent. Man, on the other hand, fell into corruption because he was seduced by his self-love, but also because he was deceived by the devil. The devil's fall was due to purely inward reasons. The fall of man was due in part to external reasons. The devil was not subject to any external influences. His evil was purely internal, which is why his sin was perfect. Conversely, the fall of man admits of degrees of greater and less. It was not perfect in the sense of being absolute. Again, this is why God did not abandon man, but helped him and guided him toward his salvation. The devil, on the other hand, had lost all capacity for any further kind of movement or turning toward the good. Neither could he be restored to his former position in any way, because the act he committed was absolute and final, and it was the act of his own will, his own choice. That the holy powers, the angels, can no longer fall or turn away from God does not mean that they have lost their freedom, but that they received this gift from God. It's sort of like this. There was someone who for years asked me to make him a monk. I eventually did, and now that he's a monk, he can't get married or do other things that are not part of his monastic life. Does this mean that he is no longer free? Of course he's free, but he chooses not to marry because through his monastic tonsure he received the gift of stability in his decision, the gift of living a new life, not like life in the world. Something similar took place in the case of the angels. From all time, from the moment the devil fell, until the time Christ came into the world, the holy angels did nothing but ask God that their desire might be fulfilled to remain permanently and immutably in God. And that which they asked for from God, from all eternity and with all their freedom, they received from God as a gift. Their freedom was not taken away, but was rather filled and transformed by the grace of God. Some might say that God gave man the potential to project his ego, but this is not correct. God created yourself, not your wish to project your ego. In his infinite love, God created you, your being, which is a reflection of his love, and he asks you to accept the fact that you are a reflection of his love. But when you say, I, God, don't care about you, only I exist, 
Is this an idea that God put in your mind? Of course not. So you exist because God created you, but your ego and your desire to project yourself is a denial of God. God did not create you to deny him, but for you to enjoy creation with him. In any case, the reason for the fall of man will always generate questions. People have always asked these kinds of questions, and they always will until the end of time. Other people ask questions about the fall of Lucifer and how it was even possible if before him there was no evil. But an angel is spirit, a noetic being capable of spiritual movement, and thus it was not difficult for an angel to say, God, I defy you. No other presuppositions was required apart from a movement of free will, and in this case, the misuse of free will. Here's an example of what I mean. Let's say you are a source of attraction to me. I feel attracted to you and so strongly attracted to you that my existence, my life, my happiness, and my fulfillment consist in this feeling of attraction. And yet, God, because I am a complete and good being created by God, I am able to say, I reject the feeling of being attracted to you. This is something that I want and choose all by myself, and this is a reflection of my freedom. I want to feel attracted to you, since this seems natural, but at the same time, I don't want to feel attracted to you. And so, I make a decision. If an angel were not able to reject the attraction exerted upon him by God, then he would not be a spirit. The same is true with man. If he were not able to sin, if he were not able to decide to join himself to the devil, then he would not be a man. He would not be fully human because he would not be free. Still others say that for man's freedom to be perfect in paradise, he should not have known any kind of evil because even the mere knowledge of evil is already a constraint on his freedom. It is a condition of unfreedom. And God should not have said to Adam, if you eat from the tree of evil, you will die, Genesis 2.17, because this threat already opened up Adam's mind to the idea of something other than God, to something outside of God. But this is also incorrect, because God simply opened the horizon only very slightly and showed Adam his entire potential for becoming like God, while at the same time showing him the nature of his human existence. Had God not shown him the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam would never have learned anything. Would Adam in that case have still been a man? No, because he would have been incomplete. This means that by placing these possibilities before him, God gave him the possibility to be perfect. And because Satan was lurking about, God also wanted to protect Adam, which means that the fall of Satan was potentially something useful for the good of man. Against his only will and contrary to his plan, the devil's actions ultimately contribute to the good. This is why the fathers say we should not curse the devil. But as we said earlier, the devil is asleep as far as we're concerned. He doesn't pay us much attention. We get into trouble on our own without any help from him. If we're in the grip of passions and being moved about by our ego and selfish desires, what need does the devil have to come about? and bother with us. It's only when I cast my ego aside and struggle to reach the point described by St. Maximus that the devil can draw near to me. God created us to be the summit of his creation, to be by grace what God himself is by nature. He created us for eternal and infinite life with him, forever stretching forward and moving ever closer to God. How could you not love such a God? Who could possibly grasp all the greatness, all the glory which he has prepared for us from the beginning of time? Who ha what hasn't he given us? What hasn't he done for us? What didn't he become for us? And what are we to God? We have become Christ to him, and Christ for us is God. Are we able to live within the beauty to which God has called us? Are we able to nourish ourselves? and take delight in this beauty, I think it is very easy to do so. All we need to do is humbly accept it, receive it, and welcome it into our hearts. All we need to do is allow our hearts to leap, to know what God has called us to, to know that we were made to be like Him. If all things are Christ, how much more so are we Christ, since we want Him, desire Him, abandon ourselves for Him, in whom our hearts rejoice. 
Let us then live this life in Christ. Let us live this constant transformation of our lives into the life of Christ. Let us live the life of that other one, not the demoniac one, but the divine one, which is the one God made us to be. Let us live the life of what I, who united himself to us, the word of God, who united himself to me and who took my human I and made it a divine human I, granting it its ultimate completion and perfection. If only we could say, glory to God for all things. If only our minds could comprehend even a little. If only our hearts could leap and exult just a little. If only we could shake off just some of our insensitivity and indifference. For we are not indifferent to male and female or to slave and free, but to God himself. What wretchedness we fall into. Let us allow our being to wade into the depths of the infinite sea of God's goodness, into the light of his divinity in which he has already placed us. Let us bask in all the many rays of God's divine light, and we too will be like he is. Let us live in the manner that God intended. Let us live as he created us from the beginning. Let us live after the form of the life in which the Lord has restored and renewed us. And let us be joyful. Let us rejoice in God, for his life is ours, and our life is his. Amen. End of the mystical marriage of the spiritual life according to St. Maximus the Confessor, Elder Emilia Nos of Simonopetra, translated by Father Maximus Constance, published New Rome Press.